Good afternoon, I'm Vashon Brown with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. The Office of the Children's Advocate, OCA, is to meet with members of the judiciary to discuss a matter highlighted in Sunday's Gleaner. The article revealed that children deemed uncontrollable are being locked away in prison without a hearing or legal representation. TVJ's O'Shane Masters has the details. Under Section 24 of the Child Care and Protection Act, a child deemed uncontrollable can be placed in the custody of the Department of Correctional Services. But an article in the Sunday Gleaner suggests children deemed uncontrollable are being locked away in prison without a hearing or legal representation. Children's advocate Dan Gordon Harrison says in cases when the child is without legal representation, the presiding judge should inform the Office of the Children's Advocate, OCA, after which the matter would be put off. She explains that the OCA would later intervene to ensure due process is followed. First, we'd have to gather the statistics to see what exactly does the full picture look like, look at what are some of the issues that are causing these orders to still be made, particularly without the presence of legal representation. So we'll be making some inquiries just to see exactly what the full picture looks like, certainly across the island, since this is what the report is pointing to. Well, I mean, this is something that's priority. So while I don't like giving specific timelines to say in one or two days, rest assured it's something that will be getting our attention within very short order. She has also expressed disappointment that the correctional order for juveniles remains on the books despite promises by legislators to remove it. She argues that children considered to be uncontrollable should be psychologically assessed and sent to a special facility instead of being placed in custody. The social build-out of the options that the court really should have at its disposal is not where it's at. Um, so we clearly need to look at that more fully. We need to look at beefing up those options so that if it is felt that a child cannot remain at home because of the extremeness of the behavior but needs to be put in a facility, that facility really should be one that has all the psychological services available to help that child to be rehabilitated and to cope with whatever underlying issue is triggering the behavior. Machine Masters, TVJ News. Meanwhile, traumatizing, insensitive, cruel. That's how some persons describe the interactions between the justice system and the children deemed by the courts to be uncontrollable. It's why human rights lobby group Jamaicans for Justice, JFJ, has renewed the drive for legislative changes on how children are treated by the justice system. TVJ's Herman Green has that report. For JFJ legal officer Nastasia Robinson, so-called uncontrollable children being sentenced to years in a Department of Corrections facility is unquestionably wrong. But based on her experience, that's not the only problem. The general insensitivity with which children who are deemed to be uncontrollable are dealt with is what raises concern for us and is why we're pursuing this issue. At a JFJ press briefing on Monday, Ms. Robinson relayed a court experience she said she heard a 13-year-old girl screaming at the top of her lungs from inside a courtroom. She went to investigate and was shocked at what she saw. There were four, four or five adults, I said, pulling her, all have her two with her arms, just dragging her out of the dock. So I intervened and um, I said, the child is in distress. You really cannot be handling the herd this way. And the way that she was breathing indicated to me as someone with anxiety that this was the onset of a panic attack. She says the girl was classified as uncontrollable and so was to be placed in a cell before being taken away to a corrections facility. In her panic, the teenager refused to comply and reportedly threatened to hurt herself. Ms. Robinson offered to talk with the girl to calm her down, but says the insensitivity of the officers continued. A police officer came from around the corner with a set of handcuffs and just grabbed the child from me and tried to slap on the handcuffs on her. So I said, why are you putting handcuffs on the child? She's right here. She's not going anywhere. You use handcuffs when people are resisting. She's not going anywhere. We're all here with her. Um, essentially, the lady brushed me off and told me that she's doing her job, and this happens all the time. And that, that was the general sentiment of the workers of the court. This, is, this happens all the time. They do this all the time. All the time, they said they're going to kill herself. Nothing ever happened. It's understood that this encounter led JFJ to the renewed call for change. Uncontrollable children are sometimes sent to facilities for years. One former Armadale ward, Moya Blackwood, who now works at the BPO Center, described her experience. It was a disaster. An experience that I didn't um, think of 
that I will be going through. Eating with my hands on the first entry, being locked down for several days, not getting the chance to have a proper bath. It was basically a human prison for me then, for a juvenile. JFJ has met with a justice minister who says legislation will be brought to cabinet to effect change. Herman Green, TVJ News. The Pembroke Hall High student who was threatened with physical violence by his teacher has been removed from the school by his parents. The threats were captured on video, which was widely circulated on social media last month. Vice Chairman of the school's board, Anthony Williams, told our news center that he was informed of the development by administrators at the institution. I must make it very clear. The school did not ask the student to leave, nor did anything for him to leave. It was a voluntary decision by the, the parent. He just didn't turn back up. And our investigation revealed so far that the student has not returned to school. And I should just be more cautious to say that it appeared to us, based on the information we received, we will not be coming back. After the video went viral, the teacher applied for leave. She is to face a disciplinary panel on December 30. And it's now time for a break, but stay with us. More stories right after these messages. Welcome back. Continuing the news now. Several persons, including students, have been hospitalized following a motor vehicle accident on the Holland Bamboo Main Road in St. Elizabeth this morning. It's understood that the accident involved a motorcycle and a taxi plying the Santa Cruz to Black River route. It's not clear how the accident unfolded or how many persons have been hospitalized. And we will have more details on this developing story in subsequent newscasts. Meanwhile, four persons have been killed in road crashes in the past 24 hours. 26-year-old Javain Watson died this morning in a collision involving two motorcycles on Nampir, Nampril Road in Negril, Westmoreland. The collision happened sometime after 5 o'clock. In another incident, an unidentified man and a woman died in a motor vehicle collision on Chesterfield Drive in St. Andrew yesterday afternoon. The crash, which involved a truck and a car, happened shortly after midday. And about 5.30 yesterday afternoon, a man died on Mountain View Avenue, also in St. Andrew, after his uh, motorcycle collided with a truck. Residents from a section of Emerson Avenue, New Haven, St. Andrew, are calling for the National Water Commission, NWC, to address a sewage problem in their community. The residents say that some pipes were damaged while members of the NWC carried out repairs in the area some time ago, which they believe may be contributing to the problem. Raw sewage flowing on Emerson Avenue causing a great discomfort for many. The residents complain that the problem has persisted for over two months despite their desperate pleas for help. We have and them say they go come and them come and them look and them say January before them find pipe and it was about two months now. Oh Father God man, just look around and you see sewage around. Actually you can see the sewage around. The scent arose all but this come like a river tan. You know, you know, we need help, we need help. The scent when it comes up, it is very unbearable. We just need somebody to come and fix it. The last time I was told that the, um, our representative came in the area, he didn't come this side in at all. So I'm, I, I'm not even sure that he is aware that we're having this problem right here. But we need it started. This is more than two months and we cannot go into the Christmas season like this with kids that will be home on a holiday and needs to play. We need this road to be fixed. We cannot go into 2020 like this. And every time when the water pump up and float up and cover the whole of the road, come all up to this way, we stand up. And the same tight, we cannot take it. Sometimes it run out the people out of them yard, they have to go somewhere else to where the scent I and sting. When we come fix it, man, we are so far. As the sewage continues to flow, residents are concerned about the health risks, particularly to young children and persons with existing ailments. Belly ache, no normal or not, so them thing. The scent alone, trigger, all asthma, with the youth them. Mosquito like wow, evening time. As sun gone in, mosquito. And some mosquito look like a hand and see them have some long foot and them stay, so. You understand? But them thing that go on night for community. Corporate public relations manager at the National Water Commission, NWC, Charles Buchanan, told TVJ News that the NWC is aware of the matter. He said that measures are in place to address the situation. The National Water Commission is aware of uh, damage to a section of the sewers along Emerson Avenue. We 
have done an assessment and identified the need for the engagement of a contractor to undertake emergency works that will involve replacing a section of the sewers along Emerson Avenue. The commission is both working to address the emergency conditions as they develop and has also been preparing an overall work plan to treat with the sewering and the maintenance of the sewers in and around the entire Duane Park um, area. The residents are hoping that something will be done before children go on the Christmas holiday. For Shane Masters, TVJ News. News from the region now. A Jamaican woman who was found guilty for the death of her fellow Jamaican national in 2017 has appealed to the Barbadian court to be lenient with her when she comes up for sentencing on January 31 next year. 26-year-old Tanisha Ann Juliet Hales admitted to killing Shakaya Boyd, but told the High Court that she was not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. A post-mortem found, found that the deceased sustained 14 injuries and that death was due to hemorrhage from a stab wound to the neck. The two who were sex workers were involved in an altercation on April 28, 2017, when Hales pulled a knife and stabbed Boyd several times. Hales left the scene where she disposed of the knife used to stab Boyd. Boyd was pronounced dead at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. In her statement to police, Hales acknowledged that she and the deceased were friends at one point, but had a falling out due to a row involving another woman. Time now for sports. Cricket West Indies is seeking to explain why regional players have not been paid. According to the chairman of the CWI's finance committee, Wilford Billy Heaven, the body has been focusing on clearing its debt. But as we hear in this report from Renardo Brown, Heaven expects normalcy to be restored before the end of the year. In response to a story carried by The Glean on December 1, chairman of the finance committee for Cricket West Indies, Wilford Billy Heaven, has given assurance that the problem of players not being paid will be resolved before month end. The players will, will be paid before the end of this um, calendar, calendar year. As I said, the facility that we are negotiating within the next week or two, that should materialize because it is set on a condition you know, of doing some other things. According to the Gleaner article, the problem of late payment has persisted for the better part of a year. But Heaven, who is also president of the Jamaica Cricket Association, says the issue was unavoidable. I don't want to make any excuse for the CWA, but late payment to players and staff is not a new phenomenon. This has been happening for the last two or so years. And it's not that people will not be paid. It's just that there are some delays. But based on a meeting that I chaired yesterday of the finance committee, the CWI will very soon be in a position to offset all its obligations. According to him, the main reason behind the non-payment is the current debt CWI is facing. We have paid just under 20 million US dollars in outstanding debt since the new administration took office. So there are calls on the funds that we have, some of which have been maybe a year or more old. So we have to honor those coming down. It's not that we have ignored our players because we rely on them as our most critical asset. Heaven has assured, however, that things will change in the coming weeks. We'll let the board know the facilities that we are negotiating, which should come on stream within the next two weeks maximum. So we will be getting some bridge financing. There are currently 90 players across the six franchises under regional retainer contracts, which range from A contracts to development categories. Players with A category contracts earn US $32,000 a year, or 4.3 million Jamaican dollars, which works out to be 359,000 Jamaican dollars per month. Development contract players can earn U.S. $12,000 or 1.6 million Jamaican dollars per year, equivalent to 134,000 Jamaican dollars per month. Renardo Brown for TVJ Sports. And that's the Midday News. I'm Vashon Brown. Join us at 7 for Primetime News Package. On behalf of the news, sports, and production teams, have a good afternoon.